of 1672 on the western shore of the Patuxent River that runs into the Chesapeake Bay in an area that's now called Maryland, George Fox met with the Lenny Lenape Indians. <clears throat> George Fox was the leader of a, of a group of people from England who called themselves the Friends and were called by some people the Quakers. The Indians called him True Word. <clears throat> the Lenni Lenape Indians 
had for the last 100 and, 100 and more years, they had been cheated, frauded, uh, pushed out of their lands, deceitfully used by the English and the Dutch, and they were skeptical of all Schwannics, which is what they called the white man. <clears throat> With the exception of very few, they had found them all to be greedy, covetous, liars, murderers, and, and, and people that that they, without any scripture, without, without the ability to read, knew within their hearts are wicked men. <clears throat> and they were, they were hesitant to even go meet this man. Because he was a white man. But there, was one, there was one man among the Indians, who's, who they called Sage Mias, who... Uh, who persuaded them otherwise. This, this Mias was, for those of you who know who, who uh, the Indian is by the name of Glekikin, this Mias is his grandfather. <clears throat> uh, he said, we're not like the Schwannics who cannot hear any music but their own. We are not like the Schwannics who, who, who think that any flower that they did not plant has no beauty. I will fly as the honeybee does. And I will taste true words flower. If his flower is sweet, I shall bring his honey back to the hive. If the flower is bitter, I will return no more. And with that persuasion, he and some of the Indians went to test George Fox and his friend's words to see if he was like other white men. George Fox carried no gun or sword. His gray coat and hat were without any kind of adornment. The Lenape Indians liked their quietness and respectfulness shown at the meeting, and their words were careful and weighty. And after some talk, the Indians inquired of George more closely why he's here and what, what he's about. And George Fox got up and he spoke these words while Sage Mias interpreted them to the Lenape Indians. <clears throat> he said, I serve the Lord God who made heaven and earth. He is the God of the whole earth of the seas and of the winds, and he made the clouds his chariot. It is beyond all words to tell of his greatness. Blessed is his name forever. He is over all, and in his great power and wisdom. Amen. I serve this creator God from day to day and night to night. I will not make an oath to serve any other man or God, and I will not bend my knee or doff my hat, even for the king of England. Nor will I wield the sword or soldier for any man or cause. The weapons of our warfare are not guns and bullets, but truth. This same Creator God has sent His Spirit to kindle in my heart a fire, a light, that guides me into truth. God is not a respecter of persons who cares only for an Englishman. God cares much for every man he created, be he bondman, free man, slave, or Indian. In the heart of every man, God placed a spark of light that guides that man into truth, and each man may fan that spark within himself into a flame of light that shows him truth, or he may smother that spark of light until he can no longer find truth. <clears throat> Let me read that last couple sentences again. In the heart of every man, God placed a spark of light that guides that man into truth. Each man may fan that spark within himself into a flame of light that shows him truth, or he may smother that spark of light until he can no longer find truth. <clears throat> I think those words are true in this, this message. Uh, Resonated with these Indians who never read a book. Uh, it made sense to them. It was a, a totally different message, a totally different thing than what all these other, all these other Schwannics had been doing in the name of Christianity. And it made sense to them. <clears throat> there is light and there is darkness. There is truth and there is falsehood. 
And I believe that within every man, whether, whether he's ever seen a Bible or heard a preacher, there is some little spark of that. <clears throat> At least in some point in his life there is. The Gospel of John starts out by saying, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things came into being through Him, and apart from Him nothing came into being that has come into being. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. In him was the life, and the life was the light of men. If, if God is removed from something, if God is removed from a picture, there is no more life. It is, it is God that holds life together. And if he's removed, there's only death. And as long as somebody is alive, there is, there is at least some element of God there that, it, that, 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 that can be enough light that can be fanned to be to, 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 to be a flame that can bring us into more truth. <clears throat> if we fan this spark and follow truth, we are preparing our vessel for the Holy Spirit of God to come and dwell within us and to make His abode there and from there guide us into all truth as it says in John 16, 13. The disciples of Jesus followed, they followed Jesus. Jesus said he is the truth, and they followed him. They followed him even when they didn't understand him. They followed him in spite of many things that, that made no sense to them, and they stayed loyal to him. They were so dedicated to the truth, which is Jesus Christ, that even, even when, when 70 of the other disciples left him because of a hard saying, these twelve said, where else shall we go? And they stuck with truth. And because of their loyalty to the truth, when God did pour out the Holy Spirit, they, they were so ready to receive it, that, that however this was, in Acts, uh, the, the, the Spirit rested upon them as if flames of fire were on each one of them. <clears throat> Let us be like those men, unshakably devoted to truth. <clears throat> Paris Reed had said in one of his sermons how he went to do missionary work in Africa. And he went there because he didn't want anybody to go to hell without having a chance to be saved. He wanted to give these poor sinners a chance to go to heaven. And when he got there, he discovered that they weren't poor little heathens running through the woods waiting for someone to tell them how to go to heaven. They were monsters of iniquity who were living in far more defiance of God than he had ever dreamed they had. They deserved hell because they utterly refused to walk in the light of their conscience and in the light of the law that was written in their hearts and the testimony of nature and the truth that they did know. He found that they knew about heaven, and they didn't want to go there, but rather loved their sin and wanted to stay in it. <clears throat> that little spark is there when somebody has life. I met this man at Springfield one time who... Uh, when I was preaching there, and probably I had one of my signs probably said something about divorce and remarriage, I'm not sure, but, but he came and he started asking me about that subject. And this man, I don't remember all the detail, but his life was a, a chaotic shambles. He's been in and out of prison. He's been, he's been married and, and lived with I don't know how many women, he told me, and, and he wanted to know about this, this thing. And I told him, well, you know, whichever one of these women that, that had not been married before that you were first married to, uh, that, that's your rightful wife. And he said, that's the only one that ever felt right. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, we dare not quench this spirit. We must prove it, but we dare not quench it. 
And as George Fox said to the Lenape Indians, it is within our ability to fan this spark into flame to show us truth, or it is within our ability to smother it until we can no longer find truth. Children, guard your hearts with all diligence, the proverb says, I think the proverb. For out of it are the issues of life. Paul told Timothy, I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God that is within you. <clears throat> All of us who've ever started a fire know, know that it needs, some, it needs some air. It needs a little bit of a fanning. Um, if, we're <clears throat> if we're starting a new fire, we, we're careful. We, we just, just lightly breathe upon it. And once there's a little bit more flame, we can give it more air. But, but, but we can also just blow it out. Just, I, I thought about that and I thought, keep, keep that in mind as we, as we instruct children, as we instruct people who have not yet seared their conscience, but, are, but just still have this spark. Um, uh, uh, help them fan it. But use wisdom. And, and, then, and then sometimes, if, if you've ever experienced this, like if there had been a fire, if there had been a great big fire or a campfire, and it burns down and there's nothing there but ashes, and sometimes, depending on the size of the fire, a long time after that, like a long time after the flame is gone, and just gray ashes are over it, it looks like there's nothing there, you can blow you can blow on it and there's just enough ember there to bring it back to life. And, and that, kind of, that kind of fire often takes a lot of, of, of air. You can, the more vigorously you can fan it, the, the more likely you can bring it back to flame. And I think that's kind of like people who, 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 whose fire has gone out, who once had it. Uh, and it's at least smothered or partially smothered. <clears throat> And it doesn't take too much to smother the whole thing. If you, if you want to cover that fire and let it get no oxygen or not paint it, it will go out. <clears throat> this Holy Spirit wants to guide us into all truth. It wants to guide us beyond the element, elementary principles, as it says in Hebrews, of repentance and from dead works and, and, and faith toward God and baptism and resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. It wants to guide us beyond those elementary things, in, into things more excellent, into things more mature, into things more perfect. <clears throat> I want to read a couple verses in Philippians 1 that have been inspiring to me. Verses 9, uh, 9 to 11. For God is my witness, how I long for you all with the affections of Christ Jesus. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve the things that are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ having been filled with the fruit of righteousness which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of, of God. Paul is not writing this to, um, to uh, ungodly, unsaved people, you might say. Um, he is not, uh, he's not writing this to people, he's writing this to the church. And he says, uh, that they should abound still more and more in real knowledge, in all discernment, so that you may approve the things that are not just elementary, not just foundational, but approve things that are excellent. Things, things that, um, that, that, that this, this light should guide us into. <clears throat> and the Spirit would want to guide us into. He 
she's in encouraging them to, to continue to fan this flame. <clears throat> There's a verse in Chronicles, Second Chronicles chapter 16, that says something like, The eyes of the Lord go to and fro over the whole earth in search of a man whose heart is right toward him so that he can show himself strong in. That, 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 uh, that flame, that fire, that spirit that, that he wants to, that he wants to, to, to bring in on, to bring to a man so that he can show himself strong and he, his eyes are going over the whole earth looking for someone whose heart is right so that he can do that. So God needs men. And I would encourage us to be those men. And I've just wrote, written down a whole list of, of men that I think God is looking for. And I'm going to read these just in hopes to stir up our minds. <clears throat> God needs men. Men who are led by the Spirit and lean not on their own understanding. God needs men who fear God so greatly that they hate sin in every form and every appearance of evil. God needs men who love God so greatly that they love righteousness and diligently pursue truth. God needs men who pray without ceasing. God needs men who can think deeply and reason soundly. God needs men who can look beyond the surface and the facade, and dig out the deeper substances of matters. God needs men who can still use their brains to figure things out, rather than turn immediately to Google, Bing, and Yahoo. God needs men who realize that they do not need to stay informed of everything that goes on around the world just because it's on their smart devices. God needs men who are not slaves to the allurement of social media and electronic technology. God needs men who in the midst of this madness can be still and hear God. God needs men who can observe nature and learn the laws of God from birds and animals, plants and rocks, rivers and clouds and fish and insects. God needs men who have victory over lust, anger and all personal sins. God needs men who can work hard and diligently through sweat and pain without being a slave to laboring for the meat that perishes. God needs men who can manage finances and be godly stewards of it. God needs men who have conquered their desires for fancy foods and don't give in to appetite. God needs men who can speak with sisters without the slightest evil thought. God needs men who can speak and play with children on their level without entering into any foolishness. God needs men who know how to use and enjoy the natural gifts of God without indulgence or intemperance. God needs men who have learned to give alms generously, cheerfully, and secretly. God needs men who know how to be content whether they abase or abound. God needs men who discipline themselves and are not afraid of hardships and to beat their bodies into subjections and make it their slaves without being unsocial ascetics. God needs men who have no interest in expensive clothing, sightseeing, relic collections, and don't waste their time and money on useless things. God needs men who are so filled with the Holy Spirit and so deeply rooted in love for all mankind that nothing can provoke to them to an unloving attitude toward anyone. God needs men who are so deeply rooted in humility that man's praise and man's criticism have the same effect and don't move him from his awareness of being the least of all saints. God needs men who can hear an accusation or repro reproof, whether true or false, without immediately going on their own defense. God needs men who are not stubborn, but gentle, open to scrutiny, and easily entreated. God needs men who refuse all earthly honors and titles offered to them for their labors for God. God needs men who have no desire to dominate or govern others and have no longing to be called elder, leaders, or masters, 
but seek to be a brother and a servant to all. God needs men who have learned how to bridle their tongue and by the help of the Holy Spirit use it to the glory of God. God needs men who have been successfully disciplined by God through the fires of opposition from relative friends and religious leaders. God needs men who will never be influenced by wife, children, relative, friends, or other believers to cool off even, the, even slightly in their devotion to Christ. God needs men who tremble at the word of God. God needs men who weep and shed tears over sins, the lost, and the poor, and the oppressed. God needs men who can see the hungry, naked, sick, and imprisoned in their local area. God needs men who are willing to be all things unto all men, that by all means they might save some. God needs men who are fearless witnesses of truth. God needs men who can identify wickedness in high places without getting entangled in all kinds of conspiracy theories. God needs men who have a clear understanding of the difference between the true church and the false church. God needs men who not only know the difference between good fruit and bad fruit, but know the difference between the seed that produces it. God needs men who are easy to get along with and are willing to be inconvenienced and taken advantage of by others. God needs men who rejoice to see their brother excelling spiritually and being honored more than themselves. God needs men who weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice. God needs men who show no partiality between the millionaire and the beggar, the white skins and the black skins, the intellectual and the idiots, the cultured and the barbarian, but will treat them all alike. God needs men who do not seek the praise of God and is willing to offend all men if necessary to seek the praise of God. Sorry, God does not seek, who, who do not seek the praise of men and is willing to offend all men if necessary. God needs men who cannot be bribed by the things of Satan to compromise the things of God. God needs men who can, can, who can govern themselves according to the principles in Scripture. God needs men who can continue to fan the spark into a flame within us and never smother it out. He needs men whose lights will shine as a continuous and visible flame, whose light is not like that of a firefly, though it's pretty, it is so brief and sporadic that it is of no assistance to finding our way through the dark. I'm going to close by reading a little bit here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Starting in verse 12. But we request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you and the Lord and give you instructions, and that you esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Live in peace with one another. We urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. See that no one repays another evil for evil but always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the Spirit. Do not despise prophetic utterances, but examine everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good and abstain from every form of evil. May the Lord add his blessing. 1 Thessalonians 5.
I'm, I don't have much to add, but I'm um, thankful to be here and be challenged. And, and uh, thoughts came, <clears throat> a, verse, a verse came to my mind uh, in Luke twelve forty nine. I came, I came to bring fire to the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. Yeah, I just want to say amen. I don't really have anything to add. I just really appreciate <clears throat> the challenge and the admonition, and I think it's timely, and it's appropriate, and it's, uh, it's just very good, and I... I just want to continue to model my walk after all all of those am ambitions and uh, and try to keep uh, a zeal for truth alive. Oh, where are things